So today we'll talk about a handful of things. We'll, you'll get a, a split talk here. I'll do the first half and Josh will do the second and then we're happy to answer any questions at the end. So the first question now is should be why? Why are we doing this? And why do it specifically in cardiology as it's not had a lot of uptake across the country in cardiology even to this point. Um, give an update on our outreach program and how Teleheart kind of fits into that program and also talk about the growth that the program has seen over the seven years it's been uh, in effect. Obviously, telemedicine really came to the forefront with the pandemic, so we'll talk about what effect the pandemic has had on our program and also across the country, the impact of Medicare on, on some of the rules that we have to play by. Uh, Josh will cover that as well as a potential vision for sort of that next step of how do we continue to ascend uh, this mountain of telemedicine. And then we'll go over questions. So first question again is why? Uh, why do telehealth and cardiology? Um, when we really actually look at, at telehealth and, and where actually cardiology care and our population is headed, um, the, the population is aging rapidly. You'll see in this bottom graph that that darker line is actually the, the population uh, projected for 18-year-olds, and the population for 65 and older is this light blue bar starting now. And so you can see that the population is just going to continue to age, and of course, the older we get, the more likely we are to need cardiology care. When you look at the other variables, we're not training more cardiologists, or at least not substantially more cardiologists than what we've had historically. And perhaps that uh, third bullet point is most staggering, which is that over a quarter of cardiologists currently practicing are over the age of 61. And so our workforce is not expanding. Our workforce is likely to shrink, and the need is exponentially going to increase. So it's time to really think through how do we accommodate this, this uh, tsunami that's coming? How do we accommodate the need for cardiology patients? And how do we actually help make it more patient friendly? How do we see patients where they wanna be seen, which is typically in their home or for sure in their hometown, if not their home? And how do we um, do a better job as a whole health system of getting access, um, triaging patients, and especially in cardiology, how do we get the right touches? Uh, we can certainly see follow-up hypertension patients and we can provide them a good service, but when we have a bunch of people waiting with abnormal stress tests and ongoing chest pain, we should probably be seeing that latter patient first. And so those are sort of my buzzwords for telehealth, which is um, how can we get access, how do we do a better job with triage, and how do we get the right touches. This is another graph showing the population for 65 and older starting in 1950 going all the way to 2050, and you'll see a big jump actually right where we're at now. In the last 10 years, we've seen as a percent of the population, uh, people over the age of 65 has increased five or six percent and is expected to increase another five percent in the next few decades. So again, asking the why question, when we started looking in 2014, uh, at the time I was our outreach uh, director, uh, patient access was already an issue. I just pointed out that it's going to become worse. Well, it already has been an issue for our practice uh, and other practices across the country. In 2014, New Ulm, which is one of our long-term partner sites had a six-week wait time for patients. And uh, one of the stories I'll never forget was I was doing an outreach clinic in New Ulm and uh, saw a very nice elderly gentleman who had been having chest pain for about eight weeks. And uh, I pulled up his nuclear stress test report from seven weeks ago, and it was horribly abnormal. And he didn't know any better. He was asked to get an appointment, and the first appointment they had was this appointment with me six and a half weeks later. And so here he was sitting on a 99% proximal LED for a month and a half. He didn't know, he couldn't triage himself, he did what he thought was the next right thing, which is to get the next appointment. And so it just, I think, points out a lot of things. One, we need better access and we also need better triage. Uh, Blue Earth at the time we initiated the program had an eight week wait for an outpatient visit. So what does telehealth offer? It really offers the opportunity to impact the whole spectrum. When you think of the patient-centric view, Patients can either hopefully stay in their home eventually or stay close to home. They can go to their local clinic so they don't have to make that decision of do I want to drive two hours for this appointment or not and then drive home two hours? Do I want to bother my son or daughter to take a day off of work? There are a lot of variables that we often don't think about as the provider in that equation of are they going to come for a visit or not? And again, trying to do this for the, the right time and at the right place. When you think of our partner sites, so our rural partner sites, um, they get more specialty care. Um, they get more specialty care and access to overall care and they get help with triage. From our standpoint as the specialists, um, why would you do telehealth? Well, you can actually increase the amount of visits you can do. You can decrease the travel. We haven't seen a substantial increase, in fact, a slight decrease in the number of outreach in-person clinics that we've done in these last seven years. 
We've actually been in more locations with more touches because of Teleheart. And so, especially when we talk about our procedural subspecialists, um, thinking about getting the right touches. Um, uh, our electrophysiology team, for example, has been doing these visits since 2015 in Baxter, where our partners in Brainerd Baxter area find an appropriate candidate for an AFib ablation. That patient doesn't have to decide to make three trips to the Twin Cities, one to hear about the, the procedure, a second one to do the procedure, and a third one to do the follow-up for the procedure. They really get to meet the person that's going to do their procedure via telemedicine, understand that they are a good candidate, that this person I'm talking to that's going to do my procedure will do a good job. They come down once for the procedure and get their follow-up in Brainerd and Baxter, just as one example. So actually, in a way, this almost fits best with our procedural subspecialists in that they can vet candidates for procedures and then do the appropriate pre- and post-care uh, close to home. So this is actually uh, interesting, quite interesting to me. The American Heart Association published a, I want to say it was a 70-page um, paper about the need for telemedicine in uh, cardiology. How many real-world examples did they show? Zero. <laughs> there wasn't one. And so acknowledging that, yes, there's this need, there's a tsunami that's coming, um, and I think they're just trying to get people to pay attention to the fact that we need to look into this and start doing this. As uh, Scott mentioned, we started our program in 2014. So we took that opportunity to send an article to the American Heart Association in circulation about our program. And so we talked about how we designed our program how we did the initial results and had three years' worth of data at this point, and this was the first publication on cardiovascular use of telehealth, uh, which uh, we're quite excited to be a part of. Also, again, trying to get the word out, trying to see what others are doing across the country. We've given presentations at MedAxium, a keynote address at the Virtual Healthcare, and Deb Lindgren Clendenin, or Deb LC as she goes by, who's been our nurse practitioner that started with the program in 2014 and has really been a wonderful partner in this program was actually selected to be a part of the ACC's first telehealth conference uh, last May, and we, we both presented during this during the pandemic. So it's really neat to be able to get the word out from our standpoint, but also, of course, to see what people are doing across the country. And as I mentioned, there really hasn't been a lot of cardiology uptake for telehealth pre-pandemic. So switching gears a little bit to our outreach program and to the teleheart program specifically, I'll spend a fair amount of time on this slide. Some people know this really well, others uh, not as well, so I think it's really helpful to look through the map of where the Minneapolis Heart Institute goes. The Minneapolis Heart Institute, as you know, is in the metro here in this, this box. Oh, good, the pointer works. This box here shows the uh, metro area. Those that have the red coloration are the ones that we consider our metro hub locations that have five days of cardiology services. So we have general cardi cardiology every day. We have our subspecialists going to these sites. We have imaging available. Again, trying to be present where our patients are, especially in the metro in these densely populated areas. As many know, we've got partners that work and practice in Brainerd and Baxter area. That's why those are red. And on this map as well now is our, are our United partners in the Eastern Metro. Um, their home base is at United Hospital in St. Paul. Uh, they've formulated a metro hub location in Woodbury just in this past year, which has been already very successful. When you take this in all total, it's uh, 45 outreach sites. When you combine our east and west metro teams, we have just under 90 cardiologists. And so when you start doing the math of trying to cover and playing a game of Tetris to see who can go where and how often can we go to these places, it's really difficult to get that access and to, to time it right and to fit it right. And so it's hard to do all the things in all the places and, and cover all the bases that we need to cover. Um, when you look at the, the green flags here, these are our sites that have Teleheart. Just as a reference, some of these sites are a two-hour drive in one direction. So again, um, not putting that decision in the patient's hands of do I, uh, is it worth it for me to drive to this visit or not. Finally, I think uh, it was really interesting to me, we just uh, had an external review of our practice by uh, several uh, consultants as part of a contractual thing, and uh, they really pointed out two, you know, what we call special factors for the practice, uh, things that really make the Minneapolis Heart Institute stand out compared to other practices across the country. The first and largest was, was clearly our management service agreement, the ability to be physician-led, to partner with our dyad partners and administration to help lead a practice, grow a practice, and be a part of a practice that's, that's thriving. The second was our outreach program was this is actually the largest outreach program in the country for cardiology. And so I think it's uh, 
speaks to the complexity of this, it speaks to the importance of this, it also speaks to our, our founding members who were wise enough to make really strong relationships with all of these sites uh, to make it a patient-centric care, but also care for uh, the, the partners and physicians at these sites as well. But this is really interesting. This is a heat map of the zip codes that we've seen outpatients at MHI for in the past three years. Obviously a lot from Minnesota, you can see a whole lot in Florida, but really across the country. Um, so there is a national outreach essentially for MHI. And so as we think beyond just the scope of Minnesota, and that, that slide I just showed you of the map of Minnesota, how do we actually even get better access, not just here, but if we can be more forward thinking, more available, um, and if we can learn the rules that Medicare and others put in front of us, how can we actually provide access uh, beyond the Minnesota-Wisconsin borders? In terms of our, our program itself, uh, it started in June of 2014. I still remember that first visit very clearly, and I uh, can't believe it's seven years ago already. Um, but when you think through these sites, these were partner sites that we had a lot of discussions with early on to say, here's why, and, and a credit to Toby Fryer, who's the CEO at New Almond, still is, for really wanting to push rural care forward. He was a big part of making this program happen. Um, so these are our first five sites. As we look over the course of that seven year history, each year we've added something uh, in terms of expansion, and I'll talk about the services on the next slide. As I mentioned, we started using our subspecialists, and I just want to give credit to uh, Tamara and Rad and EP, and also to Peter Ackman have been huge champions of this. Um, when Peter Ackman, who sees the sickest of the sick patients, tells me that you know, 90% of it is just the conversation. And so being able to have access to those patients in Fargo that may need an LVAD, may need a transplant, 90% of it's the conversation. The other 10% is what they've probably already had, which is 100 echoes <laughs> in serial visits. And so it's really a matter at that point of when you're seeing that subspecialist, do I need this procedure? Do I need this uh, end-stage therapy or not? Um, 2016, I'll, po I'll point out the first light, Pine City. This is a site that we actually did not go to in person. So this was our first site that reached out to us to say, hey, we want more access to care. We heard about this program. Um, so their partner site is in Mora, which we do go to in person. But we basically opened a brand new site for the practice um, in a location that we didn't go to. And this site has continued on and, and been a great site for us. Uh, in 2018, the heart failure team expanded their bridge clinic concept to telehealth. And so uh, uh, credit to Lisa Smith and Megan Delaney for really making this happen as well. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, the ACC and HA recommend that anybody that's hospitalized with a heart failure admission be seen three to five days later. Well, if you're hospitalized here from New Ulm, the last thing you want to do three days after you just finally got out of the hospital is to drive two hours back here <laughs> to say, keep taking your meds, check your weights, and so on. And so this is a great way for those patients to stay local. They're still going to get that visit, which is critically important for keeping them out of the hospital because they need all of these messages reinforced while you're in the hospital, take your meds, here's why. Um, and so this has been a really a great service that's had an impact on uh, heart failure readmissions. And as you can see, we continue to add sites even up until very recently, our two joint venture sites with Ridgeview, LeSueur, and Arlington, which we do not go to in person. We're going to start doing uh, facilitating teleheart visits, both to see the need, what need do they have for cardiology services, but also, again, to support our partners in those locations. We have had a few sites that have uh, dissolved over the years for different reasons. The top two, just because they're such frequent in-person uh, visits that they really didn't need the teleheart addition. Um, Fairmont had a, a different change in their ownership, and then Naples was one that we worked really hard at for a few years had good relationships there, but the practice really didn't build and became uh, reached the critical point where the value wasn't there. I think also important to point out some site transitions. There are two, both Olivia and our two locations in Morris, where we used to go in person and actually go quite frequently through a, a joint discussion with the sites and with our leadership team, decided that actually they're so far away <laughs> and, and the need for cardiology services is relatively small. So let's maybe right-size this and do teleheart as opposed to doing in-person and teleheart. And so this is a great, I think, uh, uh, compromise with these sites to say, we'll absolutely want to give you service. We can still give great service. Um, from a practice standpoint, it allows us to put those physicians in the metro where they're going to have a very busy day and be very productive for the practice. So if you look at our current offering, uh, 14 sites in total. Um, in red are the sites that are just teleheart only. 
And so if you look at that very quickly, seven of our 14 sites are just teleheart only. So again, a handful of these sites are sites we would not have if we didn't have a teleheart program. And many of these sites now have transitioned to teleheart only, which again allows us those patients the access, allows us to triage them appropriately, and gets us the appropriate touches without having to commit the physician resources uh, to these seven sites consistently. So I'll talk a little bit about the programmatic growth here, and then I'll, I'll pass it on to Josh. Uh, when we look at our, our visits in 2014, despite starting in the summer, I think I was surprised, as many others were, that we saw over 100 patients that first year. It was really started uh, more robustly than I was expecting and uh, gradually and continually picked up, uh, both in terms of the number of sites that we're seeing, but also in terms of total visits. If we annualize where we're projected to be this year, we'll be back up right around 900, which is close to where we were pre-pandemic in 2019. We're at 600 visits through August. In terms of the expansion of, of different things that we've done, we really, again, wanted this to be a touch point for consults and follow-up patients that need close follow-up. There are other things that have been asked over the years. Sometimes people need urgent pre-op or de Department of Transportation physicals. Some of these urgent visits fit really well with, these, with this uh, type of practice, as I mentioned, the Bridge Clinic. And I really wanted to, to give Deb kudos for uh, starting a pilot where she actually staffs the visits. So as, as I think um, people know, our advanced practice provider team here at MHI is outstanding. Um, they do a great job on the clinical side. I already mentioned the Bridge Clinic for seeing heart failure patients. Same idea for people that have heart attacks. They need to be seen three to five days later. Our advanced practice provider team does an excellent job with that. So Deb actually took the initiative to look at opportunities for this in teleheart so she can actually staff the visit. The patient's roomed at their local clinic by a, a, um, a medical assistant or a nurse, and then Deb can actually facilitate the next step in the visit with our cardiology curbside doc or one of our physicians helping her staff if necessary. So she started this, and a great example is our Fairbo day, which used to be a six-patient day for the doctors, is now a three-patient day for the doctors. They do the consults in the morning, and she does the follow-up visits in the afternoon. So this has been, I think, a great addition to the program as well. Some kind of factoid slide here, some additional things that may only interest me, but I thought they were interesting. Um, so in terms of talking about getting those people that really need to be seen, seen, when you compare the ASAP and consult volumes versus a traditional outreach clinic, we actually see over half of our patients as newer ASAP patients. If you look at a traditional outreach clinic, it's about uh, one out of five, so 22%. And so we clearly are providing access and providing access to those that need care uh, quickly. Um, and again, a quarter of those are done actually by our subspecialists. So they do a really nice job of using this tool to see the consults. Our wait times are tracked, and they're consistently less than two weeks at our teleheart sites. As we mentioned, some of these sites were six to eight weeks pre-pandemic. Most of them are, or sorry, pre-program, and most of them now are less than one week. They have the same access that week via teleheart. One thing that we really were, were careful about, and my biggest concern actually starting the program, was the patient satisfaction piece. We're talking about people in their 70s, 80s, and beyond. Are they really going to want to sit in front of a screen and feel like that's a real visit or not? Um, obviously, the pandemic changed that perception, but in 2014, it was a real question of, okay, is this going to be something that's going to feel real to them, that they're going to think this was a valuable visit? So we actually tracked a pre and a post survey to see comfort with technology, whether they felt it was worthwhile to do this type of visit, and as you can see, the scores were in the upper 90%, which may be a little reflection of Minnesota Nice and maybe a little reflection of their fact that they love the convenience of the visit, but at least they, they felt comfortable referring uh, friends or, or family members to this type of visit, which I think is important, of course, for the program. And also, again, a credit to Deb and team for doing a, a very thorough quality tracking. We do you know, quarterly reviews of any quality issues that come up, whether it be with uh, technology or with any of our partners or any, any issues that come up. We want to make sure that we address them, and, and we actually also do yearly site visits where we travel to the sites to really get direct feedback about how things are going. So um, it's been, I think, Seven great years so far, and I think we've got uh, much more to do. Josh? Is that working okay? Okay. Well, I want to thank Mark for including me in this and, and the opportunity to participate in the program. When I came here, um, it was very clear this was a unique opportunity within our practice to uh, expand outreach. When I was in Seattle 
one of the things that was very clear is we were very insular. We, were, we knew our, our network, but we didn't know anything outside of the area. And there was huge demands out in Washington State. And I often had, had proposed, let's, let's reach out, let's, let's do this up. And the MHI group had seen this right from the beginning. So when I came here, I was very excited about uh, the opportunity to participate in the program, but also saw the potential. And so I want to talk a little bit about kind of where we were at and where we we're going. Um, when I first came here, Scott was my, uh, my advisor to teach me around. And I remember Scott pulling down his glasses every time we were on rounds. I thought, oh man, I'm so glad I don't need my reading glasses yet. But here I am. <laughs> so as we all know, life changes quickly. So the stock market crash, or is that the dot-com the dot bubble, 9-11, the 20, 2008 financial crisis, and COVID. These are all considered black swan events. Black swan events were, was a term that was coined by a financial guy in the early 2000s, well, actually pre, prior to that, where these are catastrophic events that were life-changing, but they were unexpected and unknowable. And most people were able to look at these events and say, look at all the negativity and all the downside to it. But a select number of people who really succeeded were able to look at these events and see the upside. And so we are now in the throes of a transformational once in a generation event in healthcare with the COVID pandemic. And as you can imagine, the telemedicine use in the US has skyrocketed during the, the pandemic. We've seen a continual rise during this and we don't even have data now within the last 12 months, but it has continued to rise and it's proposed that about 45% of all Medicare enrollees have used telemedicine at least once. So we think about that, the, the number is actually staggering, considering that before the pandemic, they're only logging about 15,000 telemedicine uses in Medicare per year. And a very nice analysis by McKinsey looked at, this is actually not percentage, but actually X of, of telemedicine use compared to pre-pandemic and how we had this big spike in April 2020, but we've really sustained this nearly 40X increase in telemedicine use throughout. And as a group, we've been able to participate several ways. We had our standard teleheart visits, which just so everyone's on the same page, this means we, ha we have a site origination from Abbott to a patient that is in a clinic somewhere else. And this was largely driven by Medicare rules, which I'll talk about briefly in a second. But with the pandemic change, we were able to move towards telephone visits and video visits. And Abbott did okay with the video visits, but they made it a little bit cumbersome to, to get up and rolling. And my wife, who's at Park Nicollet, they rolled with video visits using Google Duo from day one, and they've, they've done nothing but video visits. That's gonna be important as we look forward to what's coming up. Um, but this analysis by McKinsey also looked at the fact that probably 250 billion of the current healthcare spend in this country, nearly a quarter of the spend, probably can be virtualized over time. So the opportunities are great. So we are unfortunately, for better or for worse, relegated to following the rules of Medicare. The, the third party payers, payers tend to also come up with their own rules, but they often will follow the Medicare rules. And given the fact that most of our patients are of that Medicare age, this affects us greatly. And so there are three categories uh, of services that Medicare looked at in terms of what are we doing with, te with teleheart or telemedicine. Category one are the things that really already existed. They've been doing this for, for a while. Category two were ser services where they saw a, an opportunity and they weren't sure if this is gonna be a long-term thing that they could keep on or they are gonna need to relegate and do, discontinue these or not. But category three were things where they clearly set out a vision to say, look, these are gonna be temporary things that we do for, for the public health emergency that we probably weren't gonna continue on long-term. And for us specifically, it affects a couple of things. Cardiac rehab, we're not doing a lot of virtual cardiac rehab, but there are some groups that are doing it. But the whole hospital and observation admit progress and discharge, whether or not you're in the same facility or not, was, was a big part of this. ER visits, critical care vi virtual visits, phone visits, which are the bulk of our virtual visits, and then home visits, particularly also for new patients, which is a big sticking point of this, of this situation with Medicare. 
And so what we're going to see is this category three is going to roll back at the end of the public health emergency. They are currently working hard to try to petition to try to get uh, more coverage from Medicare. Medicare has been pretty set in, in what they want. They're, I think they're really afraid of the cat getting out of the bag at this point. They're really afraid of what this could do for expenditure in healthcare within the Medicare population. And so they've already basically have said that there's some flexibilities that are, that are set to expire. The, the HPSA and the MUA are basically are essentially the regional uh, health, the regional rules around where you can receive healthcare. These need to be underserved areas. So for us in Minnesota, this is great. It's part of the reason we've been able to be so successful because we have a lot of underserved areas in this state. But they're going to basically, that waiver where you could uh, do a virtual consult on somebody in the same building, all that's going to go away. The one that's really difficult for us is that the waiver of allowing patients to be located in their own home is going to go away. So if you think about the vision of telemedicine, as Mark had laid out, really being able to meet people in their home versus, in a, versus another facility is of a huge benefit to these people. Um, not only for our personal sort of ability to, to outreach to more patients, but for the ease of care for a lot of our patients who are often elderly and have transportation issues and have to travel, you know, 50 miles just to go to a clinic. And the other thing that is going to be an issue is, been, is going to be the expiration of the telephone visits. Medicare has recognized that there needs to be a little slight higher bar or, or a higher hurdle to, to achieve to make this a billable service. That being said, they are postulating a potential uh, new sort of check-in code that will allow pay people to do just audio only if there's no other uh, technology available. So for your, for your farmer who has no smartphone, no broadband access, maybe that might be an option for us. But here's the problem. All of this is changing on a daily basis. And I started digging into this rabbit hole and it, w it blew my mind. I just, I, it got to the point now where there are people like Kathy Bigga who is an expert, Matt Axie, who's an expert in this, but the rules are changing on a daily basis. So we are gonna need a team of people in, in conjunction with our coders and our billers to basically keep on top of this so that we can make sure we're, we're doing the right things because we are going to, it's gonna change. Currently, we're still in the public health emergency. We don't know when it's gonna exactly expire, but it's coming down the pipeline. So when I came on board, one of my favorite things to do is to program build. I like to sort of work on systems, try to make things more efficient and try to, to grow programs. And so when Mark asked me to step in, one of the things I'd spent a lot of time doing is sort of trying to lay out a vision where I thought this could go. By no stretch of the imagination is this operational. These are ideas that I postulated, I think areas that we can push this system so that we can be not only the initial program to, to run this, to be the example around the country. And when I think about the ability to build a program and have this up and running, it's like climbing Everest, right? It's, it's a huge undertaking and it takes a lot of preparation, a lot of support staff. And thankfully, because of Mark and Deb and Shiraz and everybody who's working on this, we're already starting up a camp too. Everybody else had been at base camp or still on the airplane. And <laughs> we had gotten lucky because we were already up here. Well, some people are catching us and up at Camp One, but as soon as these rules roll back, a lot of them who don't have the infrastructure that we do are gonna be right back down at base camp. So we are starting with a huge advantage here going forward. This is actually a, a, a um, slide put together in 2019 looking at the digital health ecosystem at that point. This has grown exponentially since then. But what you see is people see financial opportunity here. That's important for many reasons, but for us, it's going to give us options for people to partner with to, to help to grow our program. Um, obviously, there are a lot more incumbent providers, but some have st stood out. Intermountain Healthcare in, New in Salt Lake City is one that has really driven this quite a bit, especially on the inpatient side. I'll talk about that in a, in a, few, a few minutes. So. When I look at how we're going to achieve the next stages of the telemedicine, telehealth program, there's a couple of things that stand out as the keys to success. 
First of all, we're going to have to keep workflows simple. And it's got to be similar to, to clinical care. There's no reason we should step into a virtual visit and have it be any different than we were doing it in an in, inpatient or our, our in-clinic visit. We want to be able to be flexible. Why can't we combine in-person and digital practice? We've already started to do this a little bit with our virtual visits so that you could have you know, three or four inpatient or in-person visits and then you step into a, a, you know, the, the telephone visit. With the rollback of some of the rules, this is going to have to change a little bit. But this is going to be a combined effort in trying to do both inpatient or in-person as well as um, virtual care. It's got to be a great experience for the patients. It's got to be simple and it's got to be intuitive. One of the things that allowed certain practices to really get ahead in the virtual visits was the ease of, of the video visits. So for instance, when we first started doing video visits at Abbott, patients had to sign for my chart and then they had to log into my chart and we had to send them a code and we had to do all these things. And it was anything but easy. I mean, I do this all the time and I found it cumbersome. And the speaker, for, the microphone wouldn't work or whatnot. Practices that did well at this just use Google Duo and basically send the patients an initial link, the patients clicked on it, and they were instantly into the visit. So we've got to find ways that make this patient experience intuitive and very, very simple. But it's got to work for the providers as well. One of the things that's going to make this work as a practice is that there's buy-in. There's buy-in from everybody that's involved with the process and that people are excited to do it. When I came here, and to this day, well, all I would hear about, oh, I'm on, you know, I got echo day and I got to do three telemedicine visits. I mean, this was not something people were looking forward to doing. And there's no reason it shouldn't be. The, the, the potential for this is really, really great. And if you could actually sit down in a room and see 12 patients from the comfort of, you know, the room here at Abbott, instead of having to drive three and a half hours to Morris, we should be excited for that. We shouldn't be, we shouldn't be groaning. But that requires that, that when we do this, that it's got to be, these visits have to be efficient. There's going to be great support, IT and clinical support, so we're not sitting there figuring, oh, I need a fax in order to so-and-so, and how do I do this at this site? It's got to be simple. It should be no different than you sitting down in a room just you know, with a patient in the room versus sitting down for your telemedicine visit. And it's got to be flexible. So maybe we need to start thinking outside the box a little bit in terms of where do we originate our, our visits from? Does it have to be in a room at Abbott? Does it, could it be from your house? Could you do on Saturday morning and see a few patients? I mean, we're, we're gonna have to look at this in ways that maybe are a little bit different than what we, we've done in the past. We've gotta standardize and minimize technology across the system. So one of the things that is currently happening is there are multiple different groups within Abbott that are, that are or within a line I should say, that are currently working on different telemedicine programs. And guess what? No one's really talking. And we have all these different, different technologies that, that people are trying out. And so we're going to have to find a way to work together. So this is the true vision that, that we're, I'm setting out. So at its core, we need to continue to provide the same le high level of service that we've always provided. This is a mantra of we always say yes. And we're always there for these patients and for these providers just so that we can, we can always be the leader in the, in the region for clinical care. So we need to expand service. We need to go more sites. We, market already has grown this program tremendously, but when you look at that map of Minnesota and you think of how many little clinics and little hospitals there are throughout that map, we need to expand service. And it's not only location, but it's also service lines. As Mark pointed out, when we're looking at uh, procedural groups, so EP, heart failure, valve, these are groups that are ripe for this. To be able to sit down and, and give a patient a second opinion from you know, St. Cloud, who might have gone to get their AFib ablation in St. Cloud, who actually was impressed by the quality of care here, allows us to potentially then capture that patient. So not only reach, but also uh, service lines. And depending on how the rules go, when, when the pandemic hit, a lot of insurances had, had um, backed off of their, their um, statewide licensing rules. We're not sure how that's all gonna go. It's probably gonna be rolled back, but maybe we can get to the point where we've got regional sites around the country that we, we license people to do that we can, we can have it. A lot like um, Florida did, but maybe in a, in a broader sense. 
we didn't include inpatient in ER, and this is something that's near and dear to my heart because we're getting ready to launch um, LeSueur and Arlington, which are within the envelope of our, our Waconia joint venture. These are areas that we currently get some patients from, but not all. And they came to us wanting to do outpatient um, visits. And I said, that's great. We'll definitely add outpatient visits to this. But you know what? It turns out for all of these regional hospitals, one of the most important things for them is keeping their patients. They already feel like they lose so many patients to the cities. Patients hate to be transferred down here. They don't know how to get home. And so how can we help them? And, and when we look at it from our standpoint, we're sitting on Magenta. And every time we sit on Magenta status at the hospital, and patients need to be transferred because they can't, they can't stay where they are, they're going somewhere else. But if we could step in and provide ER consult and inpatient, maybe we could reduce the number of, of, of transfers we've got, we've got. In fact, reduce some of the transfers that don't really need our level of care in-house and, and save those beds for someone else. We need to reduce multitasking. And this is primarily for the providers. We all know that we are pulled in 65 different directions, but we need to get to a point where this is busy enough that this is its own thing. You can't read 22 echoes and read nuclear studies and do teleheart and take a few curbside consults. We all feel overwhelmed by all that. It just, it just gets to be too much. And we need to have this so people look forward to this opportunity to do this and reduce the amount of extra things they're being asked to do. Now, that being said, we know we're short staffed. So there are, there are gonna be some hurdles here that we need to overcome. As I alluded to earlier, allow options for originating site. Why can't this eventually, again, this is not operational, these are just brainstorming ideas, but why couldn't we get to the point where maybe one day a week your clinic is on Saturday morning from eight till noon from your house? Why does it have to be you know, nine to, to four sitting in, in the office at Abbott? Maybe we can get to the point where you know, John Lester's sitting in, in his house in Bainbridge Island and he's able to jump in and see a few patients for us. Why, why can't we get there? And so I think this is something where we'll be able to have more buy-in and, and more involvement with people if, as we're able to um, be flexible. As I just alluded to before, also we need to part with other Alina groups. We're already starting conversations with the uh, telehospitalist program. We're gonna sit down and meet with the, the telestroke program. And Alina, I know, I know that they wanna get to the point where they're able to offer packages of services to different regional centers. Uh, but we need to learn from each other as we go through, forward with this so that we can simplify all of this. Um, and then we need to partner with industry and insurance. Uh, we need to get to the point where um, we are looking at opportunities to help drive transformational change with this. We need to be the ones trialing a lot of the new technology coming out. There are two um, new uh, insurance products coming out of uh, uh, United Health Group. Uh, one is staying internal, one is, is um, external, but they're both looking at ways to, to cut costs and to be more efficient. And so maybe that's an opportunity for us to step in. And so there obviously are a few hurdles. From a patient standpoint, digital literacy is, going to, is an issue. Uh, we, we need to have patients who understand this. Mark's shown that the data already suggests that patients, once they get exposure to it, are on board 100%. But there's still limitations in the rural communities with broadband and computer access. And patient comfort level. Patients need to feel like they're getting value out of this. Uh, from a partner standpoint, we need partners that are willing to participate. There is a lot of ask on the partner side of this in terms of staffing, room availability, technology. Um, but if we can explain to them or help share with them that this allows their patients to stay more regional, that's a huge sell for them. We also have growing competition in this area. So not only competition from a telemedicine standpoint, but also we've got, there's a lot of pressure on, on the payers for areas that already have a, a stranglehold. So as we try to go into areas that, where, that Centra care is already in, There's, they're gonna be pressuring the payers not to cover some of those services. So we're gonna to have to show them that we are ahead of the game in terms of providing higher level of, of care, higher value. The providers need to find a way to, uh, or sorry, not they need to find a way, we need to help them find comfort with doing this on a daily basis. There are technological limitations in terms of video technology. Uh, stethoscopes, we've been, no one, in the room or know the providers I've talked to like the stethoscope we're using, we're trialing a new one. And this is something that's going to be um, evolving over time. And then echo availability, we know that that's become sort of our new stethoscope and, and ability to get echoes regionally is gonna be really important. And for the payers, both the Medicare rules and the commercial payer buy-in are gonna be really critical. We're, we're, we are going to be 
um, stuck with some of the Medicare rules, but there's a lot of lobbying to try to get those um, modified over time. And so on the last slide, I want to talk about briefly, there are a lot of technological advances that are going to come down the pipeline that we're going to be able to participate in. Um, so virtual augmented reality, I have a good friend who works for a, uh, a leading VR game company in Seattle, and we've already spoken with them about trying to develop some VR um, patient education so that you could, you could be on a VR headset here and the patient could be in Morris and you could be on, in the same room together and you could do some virtual teaching for atrial fibrillation or coronary disease or pre-procedure planning. Um, augmented reality is probably going to be actually even more important as, you could, as you'll be able to sort of have a screen with patients and have real-time vital signs up on the screen. Telecollaboration. So if we, as we move towards this integrated practice unit model down in Prairie, we're going to learn that these are areas where if we can combine um, consults with an, an ongoing uh, primary care visit and collaborate together, it's probably going to be much higher value, higher uh, care. As I mentioned, the telestethoscope, um, and that incorporates also things like real-time rhythm analysis. How can we see what the patient's rhythm is, even if we can't hear it very well on the stethoscope, how we get real-time rhythm analysis uh, remotely. Point of care ultrasound down the road, uh, as we are able to have centers that could, we can train up people to, to give us quick echo images um, that might allow us to, to um, see the heart instead of having just to rely on, on the sort of the mediocre exam. And remote rounding. So this bottom slide I mentioned about uh, Intermountain Healthcare, they actually now have, in their hospital, have a, a uh, smart TV in every single room in the hospital and allows uh, people to, to provide and specials to round virtually. So why can't we have that regional hospitals? We could, we, we could have an entire small little hospital with you know, plasma TVs and a camera, and the technology is not that expensive. And we could round on every, on every consult that needs to be rounded on. So these are some areas that we're going to see going forward. So, um, Mark, yep. come back up. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, thanks, Josh. That was a great, great uh, portion of the talk there. So, just in summary, you know, all the things you've heard so far, telehealth is clearly a key initiative to subspecialty care as we move forward and, and has a lot of applications as we've already seen and, and as we look forward in cardiology. Again, access to specialists, proceduralists getting the right touches, triage, and access. Um, it can really help our providers. It helps us, again, triage patients appropriately. It helps our partner physicians in rural mm -hmm. outreach and even our patients, uh, hopefully at home, <laughs> and get access to specialists as well. And uh, we can grow a program. Uh, we have increased interest, of course, now because of the pandemic, both from a health system standpoint, from a Medicare standpoint, and from a business standpoint. And so I think now is the time to continue to claim that that mountain, and I know Akbar Khan is salivating over in St. Paul talking about mountaineering. So, <laughs> um, so we'll open it up to questions. Actually, before I do that quickly, I just want to give a lot of thank you. Um, this is not by any means a one or two person program. A lot of thought leaders on this. Bob Hauser was really kind of the person that really pushed the initial idea. Uh, John Lesser as well. Peter and the Riot have really helped push this up, especially with camera. I mean, we have a whole team that meets regularly, monthly as well as our outreach team, obviously the Spindle part of our outreach team, which is led now by Enio Palus, and then on the east side by RJ Dyer. So, um, and none of this would work if we didn't have phenomenal physicians conducting these visits. So a big thank you to all those docs that perform the visits that work in here. So thank you everyone, and, and uh, we're open to questions. Fine. Yeah, um, incredibly interesting Grand Rounds topic, uh, pretty unusual, but I think Emphasis on the process of care is probably more impactful than most of the things we've talked about. I, and thinking about expanding from seeing patients in their house to helping a nurse practitioner on call uh, in our house is, is an amazing thing. How do we, but it's, it's boiling the ocean. And we have so many things that require so much infrastructure. From my perspective, the biggest uh, value is when there is uh, a, a kind of payment for care that's capitated. And when you're actually trying to save money as opposed to just follow the rules that are out there that don't do that, then that's when this will take off. Mm -hmm. uh, and there, in the small areas where we have a fixed cost, this is when we have the greatest value. So maybe we start there and, and try to do that. 
I don't have a question. I just have a, co a compliment. I, I thought that was a, a very interesting grand rounds of a somewhat seemingly mundane topic. You guys did a great job of making it really uh, captivating. And I also want to compliment Mark for taking this from 2014 to where it is. I know Bob Hauser was instrumental in this idea. Uh, but it's like the analogy Josh used of climbing Mount Everest is really quite a good one, I think. And uh, so uh, we'll see if you guys are Edmund Hillary or not. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> What's your next step? Where where are you going from here? Yeah. So one of the, the one of the first next steps is actually going to be actually sitting down with the other telehealth or telehealth groups within Alina and trying to sort of get a um, a steering committee together that can help sort of collaborate and learn together. Um, right now, I mean, with us, our staffing issues, we're, we need to, to find a way to make the days more efficient for the providers and increase our overall um, presence on there. The problem right, we've got right now, there's some days where there's two patients or three patients, um, and that makes it hard. You can't set somebody aside. Um, we want to, I want to look at this from the standpoint of um, a collaborative a, a approach from everybody, and I like input from everybody. We're going to put a little suggestion box in the teleheart room because I want people to participate. This is not Mark's program, my program, this is all of our program, and, and we want to, we, we need ideas from everybody. Um, but I think we're going to continue to sort of get this, this, these next sites up and running, and the, um, from an actual clinical standpoint, John, the next step is once we get this, um, these two sites up and running from the joint venture, and we see how the inpatient ER consult things go, that could really be our next step. Because one of the things that will allow us to do is to fill some of the scheduling gaps. Um, if you're able to sort of schedule a, you know, we're around on this patient at 10 a.m. at your hospital, that may help as well. Uh, but John, you're absolutely right on the cap tip uh, side. The one nice thing though we also have here with, with Craig and, and the HGI program is that we're able to track the downstream effects of these things. And from the standpoint of, you know, do we capture you know, remote procedures that come into us that may not have come otherwise. Um, and does our presence there sort of help funnel in additional work? You know, it's interesting because we're under a lot, of, a lot of competitive strain right now, obviously, as you guys all know. I mean, you know, Hutchinson's a great example where, and, and HealthWorld's also bought Olivia, so we're, we've lost Echo in those locations. So there's gonna be some, some things competitively that we're gonna have to sort of find a way to work around, um, but, you're right. I mean, once we start paying fee for value, um, I think it's going to really, really take off. Agreed. I, I think thanks, John, for the compliment, but it takes a village, of course. Um, John, I think the next couple of things that will be up for our program specifically, as Josh was alluding to, is one to be a little bit more site agnostic. So you've got the telehealth provider for the day, and he or she may be seeing people from four or five different sites. And so as a site, you can say, oh, I got an abnormal stress test on a Tuesday, or there's a telehealth visit you know, today or tomorrow. We'll put them in whether it's our day or not. You know, we may keep a home base, you know, maybe a new all day, but if we can commit a provider to that role, he or she can have open spots for true ASAP type of visits so we can be a little bit more agnostic to the site. Um, we've flirted with this inpatient for, for several years, and because our cardiology curbside program is so good, a lot of sites have not wanted it. They say, no, as long as I can get a hold of a curbside person, that, that helps guide me. But several of our sites have now really kind of pushed for this to say, no, it'd be really helpful if we could actually truly see the provider. And I think for the patient-centric standpoint, it'd be nice for them to see the provider as well. So we're dipping our toes into that with the joint venture, and the hope is that if that takes off, that could be something also that would be a next clinical step. But your point of boiling the ocean is well taken, which is we can't <laughs> take it all on at once. I do have one question for both of you, and that is, one of the problems I envision with this is continuity of care yeah. in, in terms of, okay, how do we ensure that you, a patient is seen on Monday by one person and then next week and then it gets lost in the shuffle? And, and that's, I just wonder if you guys have thought yeah. about solutions to that. It's a great point. And actually that being, prescribing a person to that role for that day and having the schedule busy enough where they can have a full day with ASAPs, then you would know that it's a John Lesser day. And so it doesn't matter if the patient's in New Ulm or Blue Earth or Mora, um, the site would know, okay, this patient wants to see Dr. Lesser because they saw him six months ago. Um, he's on the schedule on this particular day where it's a more routine follow-up. So hopefully that'll help flex the continuity of care, but also give us the ASAP opportunities as well. So it's a great point. Yeah, and actually, Scott, that's one, that's one of the major complaints of the patients. That's one of the, things, the biggest dissatisfiers from a patient standpoint. And one of the nice things is where things have changed now is with the, with the pandemic changes, with these virtual visits, 
Um, what I've often done, and again, we're going to see how the, how the Medicare rules fall out, but a lot of the Medicare rules have to do with initial patients. Follow patients, there's been some different rules on. And so the idea uh, would be maybe ideally you get to the point where you have your day and you see all new consults on your day, and that in your regular clinic schedule, you're able to put in some virtual visits that, for, for the follow ups. Because I think patients would really appreciate that. I mean, we all practice a little bit differently. Um, but I think, so I think that will be a way to improve continuity of care for people. Good point, great, great point. As the, as the rules change and we've incorporated more of these telephone visits as opposed to telehealth visits, do you have a sense of the value of each of those from a provider and a patient perspective as we move forward? Yeah, I guess I'd make two comments there. I think um, one is, as Josh pointed out, the rules are continually changing. I mean, with the pandemic, <clears throat> there was a lot of hope from Kathy and others that are, you know, sit on the board of ACC and others that, okay, some of these changes now where they're gonna let us just do what we need to do clinically, that they'll take down a lot of these barriers. For example, you need to be licensed as a physician in any state in which you're sitting, no matter where the patient is, and you need to be licensed in their state as well. And so there's so many rules that make this very messy to, to just blow out the borders and say we're gonna see anybody from anywhere. Um, and I think my other comment would be that we get bogged down by the concept of billing so much, where again, I think it goes back to the touches, especially in cardiology. You wanna be able to triage that patient. If that patient needs an angiogram, you want them coming to your place to do an angiogram timely. And so that's really what carries the day in cardiology is making sure you're getting the right triage, getting the patients to the right image or, or test that they need. And that far outweighs the benefit of billing. If you miss, if you miss a, a level four billing to get the patient right where they need to be for the right procedure, um, that's more valuable as a cardiology practice standpoint. Better for the patient because they're getting the right care faster. So I think that's, I keep going back to that whenever we get bogged down in the billing, where this rule says we can't do this, or this rule says we can't do that, well, as long as we're doing something legal, <laughs> let's get the patient where they need to be to do the right, the right test. And I guess what I was maybe more getting at was the value of the dedicated teleheart where there's a nurse, they yeah. get vital signs, there's a virtual stethoscope <clears throat> versus picking up the phone during your own clinic or a video chat during your own clinic and seeing those patients wherever they are. Yeah, and, and, I, and, I, and I think there's, it's probably fair to assume that there's probably less value perceived, although for the patients, when they've been able to be spoken to in their, ho their home, I think there's probably a trade-off there, right? Um, so we'll see, I have not yet heard of any patient complaining that they got a bill for a phone call. I mean, it's, it's interesting when we think back now about all the work we have done over the years for free. Do you know a single lawyer that doesn't bill you for every 15 minutes when you call them on the phone? So there are a lot of things that now we're just starting to build toward. And, and Mark's point about the downstream services uh, is really important. Um, but I do think that from a provider standpoint and a patient standpoint, there's always gonna be more value in being able to see the patient visually. Now, whether or not that also involves a physical touching of a stethoscope by, by a CA in the room. Does that change the value proposition? I don't know. It's one of the areas that I think this VR thing is really interesting because I've, I postulated that I think that there's a potential big jump in the, in the, in the value proposition for patients if you, they felt like they were in the room with you. So we'll see how it all goes. And the wearable technology is a huge part of that too. So once people are at home with their little patch, they can tell their blood pressure, give you a two lead AKG, you can do some of these things that you would simulate in a clinic and facilitate the visit, um, again, half the battles of the conversation or more. So um, patient comfort is important, as Josh pointed out, and uh, us being able to have some objective data to make the right evaluation to triage those patients is important as we think through the next step. But it's a great question. All right. Thank you.